Our visitor today is Dr. David Hedricks, who is a uh, recent PhD graduate from the University of Surrey. Uh, David uh, is an astrophysicist specializing in galactical formation, binary stars, and population studies. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees uh, undergrad in astrophysics from the University of Amsterdam and recently completed his a PhD at the University of Surrey. A master's student at uh, in Cosmos Group in Amsterdam, he started working on population studies, uh, population synthesis. His PhD was about binary populations, mass transfer, uh, and compact object formation. Currently, David is finalizing data science projects using techniques like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. He is actively seeking postdoctoral positions aiming to continue contributing to astrophysics. Yes. So, uh, thank you. And go ahead. Right. Hi, I'm David. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about pulsational pairing stability supernovae and gravitational wave and electromagnetic transients. Uh, I see some familiar faces here, and you have seen in part this presentation already. I've added some things, I've taken some things out, um, but so uh, you, you may be familiar part with this story. Um, it's been a couple of good years now that uh, there has been gravitational wave observations um, since 2015. There has been gravitational wave observations and specifically black hole binaries mostly uh, that have been observed. And as you see in, in this graph on the left, especially in O3, things have really started to ramp up uh, and we are definitely getting enough observations for statistics of these observations. It's not only one or two observations, it's getting distribution level. Um, especially O4 is currently ongoing, that will change this graph up to another order of magnitude higher in detection rate. And uh, uh, so we're, we're really at the, at the forefront of like a new era of like gravitational wave observations. Um, that these observations allow us then to make distributions of the, of the properties of these, of these mergers. And as I said, it's mostly binary black hole mergers that we find. And what we can do is we can look at, for example, the distribution of the primary masses of these systems. Primary mass in this case, or it means that it's like the most massive black hole of the of the system. And there are some interesting features that we can see here. Uh, some of them we expect to see, and some of them we expect to see in a different place. And specifically, uh, the the peak that we see in this region here um, is interesting because it's found in a location that is not entirely expected. It's at a lower mass than we expected from um, well, from from physics and stellar evolutions we know. And my my quest here is I'm going to try to reproduce the bump that we find in this distribution, and I'm going to try to. If I cannot reproduce it, how can I change the physical assumptions so that it does match this bump? And what does that then imply about stellar evolution and other astrophysical properties down the line? Um, I'm So I'm talking about gravitational wave mergers. There's a whole bunch of different types and these uh, they originate in different environments and they can probe different properties of the source and they are affected by a whole bunch of physical processes. And I specifically am going to look at the continuous, uh, at the in-spiral wave signal. But as you can see here, there's a whole large spectrum of gravitational waves and we're really just at the at the start of an era of gravitational wave observations. Um, the relatively easiest one to observe is the in-spiral phase. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and that is, um, right on the interface here, terrestrial interferometers, space interferometers. Maybe you've heard that the LISA project has been given green light, uh, which will be launched in a decade or so. And that will be a space interferometer um, that will give us access to a whole new uh, sort of parameter space of mergers, new mass range, basically. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about merging compact objects 
uh, not about cosmological vibrations or supernova explosions that generate gravitational waves, but these are merging compact objects. So binary black holes in my case, but it could also have been neutral star mergers or binary neutral star mergers. And predominantly they occur in different in a couple of different regions. Um, relatively the easiest to handle is called the field. And that's basically anywhere, which is not in a particularly over dense environment or uh, environment with extra gaseous uh, material like AGN disks. And that's that then are the two other uh, main, main locations where these systems can be born. And these clusters, they, these other two scenarios, they uh, impose extra effects or extra uh, torques on the binary system or extra interactions. In that regard, the field is easy because the binary can be considered uh, isolated. And so we're talking about binary systems, but one thing about stellar evolution, stellar evolution is quite complex. People have been working on this very long, but it's more or less, it's it's somewhat understood, right? We, we know certain properties affect the evolution more than others. Uh, and in particular, the mass is a very important quantity that changes the evolution of a star. The, the more massive, the hotter it is, the faster it will evolve, and it will change whether it will go supernova or not. And then there's the composition, which is a secondary, but also very important effect is that stars with initially more metals in them, so higher metallicity, will basically lose more mass over their lifetime. And so if you have a black hole of a certain mass, um, there's a region of metallicities that it cannot have been born with because there's basically no way of the star to retain as much mass as it needs to form a black hole like this. So these two are the are the, the most important players that we should care about now for single stars, but binary systems, they introduce a whole extra set of things, right? Now we know a binary system is two stars that are gravitationally bound to each other. Um, they form in associations, but if they're generally formed in the field, they live relatively isolated lives. Uh, and they their properties are distributed by distributions that we start to understand a bit, or at least observe, and we can work with this. Things like the IMF for single stars, we use it for binary stars as well, but then there's period and mass ratio distributions that basically in, well, you know, inform us about what the distribution of these properties of the binary systems is. And we can observe or infer them, and then we can use this as initial distributions for our binary system. Um, the difference between binary systems and single stars, other than, well, because they come in pairs, they can start to influence each other. And it's predominantly the influence of the transfer of material between the two stars that really changes the game. Uh, there's tidal interactions like, like the Earth and the Moon have, um, and tidal interactions are very important. But if mass is being transferred back and forth, uh, that can really affect the system very strongly. Um, so this is something that we have to take care of or take into account of this. Uh, but importantly for me, binary stars become binary black holes. And this is a, uh, that's why I'm looking at these binary stars. Right? Uh, one point I want to mention about Rohr slope overflow or the transfer of material. I'm not sure if this is covered in, in undergrad courses here or if people work on this, but very briefly, if a star, uh, it, it would, during its life, a star evolves and it changes its size. Now, single stars are, in that sense, not hindered by any anything. in They can grow sort of indefinitely large. Uh, but if, if material becomes unbound, at least from M1, and can flow between the two stars via a, a accretion stream, which ide in an idealized situation looks like this, and then it either directly impacts the star or forms an accretion disk. This interaction, there is a lot of stuff going on here, and that 
it's it's a, it's a key player to determining the the outcome of binary stars. Specifically, is that this 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 transfer of mass can be become but it can be stable or it's going to be unstable. And in unstable mass transfer, basically means that any extra bit of mass that is transferred leads to more mass being transferred. And it's a runaway process that just ends in uh, either the two stars merging or uh, or a common envelope that shrinks the system significantly. And that's something that I will show in my results that these two different scenarios, they, they probe a different regime of mass. Um, but about population synthesis is that I've got all these initial distributions of binary systems, all these interactions that we can care about, but now I want to model binary systems and calculate how many black holes we see and which different properties there are. Um, and I could do this with a with a technique called population synthesis, and it basically means that I want to synthetically model a whole bunch of stars. Uh, the synthesis part means that I'm not solving the full stellar equations, but I'm taking sort of shortcuts, I, either using interpolation tables or analytic fits to the stellar evolution. But that allows me to evolve stars very quickly. So if you want to do a full detailed stellar evolution, that takes quite a while. But if I do this in a, in a synthetic way, then it uh, speeds things up by a million, yeah. million. And then I could do a lot of stars very quickly. Uh, because if we want to estimate the rates of something that's quite rare, then we need to evolve a lot of stars to probe this, uh, this, you know, this event. Um, right. And so also what's interesting is that sort of a purpose, but not really. It's I've drawn it as a black box that that gets some ingredients and some some configurations, and I then I put some in, initial distribution in there, and I get something back. I mean, we do know what's going into this evolutionary engine, but there are so many processes that work in tandem with each other that it's still sometimes quite difficult to to estimate what's going to happen to a system of an initial configuration. It's not always very clear. So sometimes you just have to see what comes out and then start to understand the relation between what's in and what goes in and what comes out. Uh, I want to do this for a large number of stars, as I said, a large number of metallicities, which is the, the other property that I mentioned. And then I can start varying certain properties. Um, and specifically, I want to vary the supernova mechanism because what I'm actually looking at is very massive black holes uh, of the order of 40 solar masses, which are basically only produced by uh, supernova um, of a certain type. And especially this feature that we find is always theorized to come from a specific kind of supernova, which is called, oh, right, sorry. I evolve all these populations of stars and then I combine that with the star formation rate history. And now I think quite some people here work in galaxies or or like large scale structure things. So you are aware of like how things work with cosmological star formation rates and how they uh, influence, for example, AGN formation and stuff. I use a cosmological star formation rate because currently I don't really care about what source, what galaxy source it comes from. But I'm working with Rob Yates to, to zoom in on like the galaxy sources of these of these binary black hole systems. But as I said, I'm looking at a certain type of supernova. And a slight background about this supernova type that I really care about is it's called parent stability or pulsational parent stability supernovae. And it basically occurs for stars that are very massive, uh, about 35 solar masses after having under like after the main sequence uh, basically they have a, a helium core which is quite evolved and that has to be 35 solar masses or higher um, and that means that initially they are quite a bit more massive than this um what happens in these stars is that the the, the density and temperature are such that photons can interact with the with the with the surrounding plasma and create electron positron pairs even briefly, but that removes the radiation pressure from the system. And these stars, at this stage in their life, they are mainly held up by radiation pressure, which is already a slightly, un like 
the quasi stable state of a star. And if you then start to remove this extra pressure that's necessary for the stability, then that can sometimes lead to uh, an instability, a runaway uh, that makes the star collapse onto itself. And that's basically going from two to three. This collapse onto itself heats things up so, so much that it can ignite um, a certain fuel. And if there's enough oxygen in this case, then that can lead to an explosion that's quite significant. And this explosion can lead to three outcomes. Um, I'm going to, yeah. So first, for A, the explosion is so strong that it disrupts the entire star. And then you get a huge, you know, supernova remnant clouds, but no remnant object, no compact object in the center. So there's no black hole at this point. Or this explosion is not strong enough to remove all of the material, but only some of the material. And then you get this, this effect of, okay, some mass is removed, but not all of it. Or the explosion is not strong enough to remove any mass and the star keeps collapsing onto itself. This is only possible for the most massive stars. And at this point, I'm currently not considering these to be relevant to, to my conquest, but my quest here to, to, the, to finding out where the peak comes from. Right? I'm mostly concerned about these stars. The, the pulse that we leave behind a remnant and this pulsing behavior sort of sort of caps the maximum mass that the star that the black, maximum black mass that the black hole can leave behind. Uh, but this process can occur a couple of times. Uh, the, the, the center is very hot, the, it's cooling via neutrinos, it's very efficient, it starts to relax onto itself again, and then it could undergo the same process two, two times, maybe three times. And then if it's still not, uh, uh, well, then it will explode in the normal normal sense through a core collapse supernova. But so this pulsational mechanism is something that can limit the maximum mass of the black holes. And if you put this into MESA or any detailed stellar evolution code, you will see that stars of a certain initial core mass or helium core mass or CO core mass, that's at this point, uh, well, we take that as being the same thing currently. If you put that into MESA and you evolve these stars, so you see basically three regions forming. This blue region is the, the sort of conventional core collapse. There's no instability occurring in the star. It just evolves up until the, the, the iron core cannot provide any fusion anymore and star collapses onto itself, explodes or not, but then you get the core collapse. In this region, the star partially becomes unstable because of the reasons that I just explained, but the explosion that follows doesn't explode the entire star. But what you do see is that if you draw a line from here to here, you see that material gets removed and the, the, the remaining remnant is slightly less massive as the pre-supernova star. And then you have the final region's parent stability region where there's basically no remnant anymore. And we can capture this in a simple fit. Uh, we can just say, okay, well, for uh, a CO core mass that we put in there, can we build a fit that predicts what the outcome black hole mass is? And depending on how you make that fit, uh, what you use as the, as the actual parameter, you get two different fits. One that matches correctly with the previous um, non-exploding part and one that doesn't. Um, my fiducial fit is basically uh, we fixed the previous fit and now it's just a continuous line. Uh, and from this circle point onwards, this exploding mechanism works. And there you see from here it starts deviating and there's a, this region of material being lost basically. But what we're predicting here is a relation between the initial core mass and the final black hole mass. And what we see here is that from the maximum black hole mass that we can find is about 50 solar masses. And so we basically shouldn't expect any, any black holes above this point, right? Um, because black holes that form at this point 
form at 20 solar masses, more or less. They, they originate from more massive stars, but they lose so much mass that they end up as quite a bit lower than the, whatever is left of there. Now, if I put all of this into my machinery, I calculate all of the binaries, binary stars, a couple of million of them, different metallicities, combine this all with the star formation rates, I get a distribution which is more or less similar to what we observe, but there's quite a couple of differences. Uh, and there's quite some stuff going on on this figure. But basically what we see in the background is the inferred of observed distribution. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of binary black hole observations from LIGO then Virgo. And to this set of observations, they make a fit, a power law and a Gaussian fit. And that's what we see in the background, the mean and the standard deviation from this. And then on the orange, we see my distributions, what I predict. On itself, not entirely bad, but there's a couple of things that we see here. Um, we see a peak at 10 solar mass, which more or less matches, but not entirely, which is already interesting. And we see another peak, not as convincing, and also not as dramatic, at a location which is not the observed location. And so at this point, there is something that's it's not matching up, right? This second panel basically shows that whatever uh, black hole we find, what's the fraction of those black holes that actually form through this mechanism that I've talked about. And we see in this region, all of the black holes that's forming here are formed through this pulsational bearing stability mechanism. So indeed this, this peak here is, is caused by this pulsational bearing stability. And but the problem was everybody always thought that this peak at 35 solar mass was caused by bearing stability supernova and that's not what we're finding. And now there is a bit of, a, of an issue. Uh, are our input models wrong um, or do we need to change something or what? Or is this peak actually not caused by bearing stability supernova? That's a, if it wouldn't be, there's quite some implications down the line that I could go into maybe at the questions, but that would have quite some, some conclusions basically if it would not be caused by this. Um, some extra things that are interesting here is that in, in this panel, we see the eccentricity of the black holes upon the formation. And we see that from more or less 30 solar masses, black holes that do merge in the lifetime of the universe and that we can observe now, predominantly uh, form very eccentric. And this, this high eccentricity basically leads to their merger time becoming a lot shorter than it normally would be. So uh, a circular binary takes longer to merge than an eccentric binary because there's this, this, this eccentricity where they come close to each other, which loses a lot of angular momentum through gravitational waves. Uh, so there is something going on that makes these systems merge. Conversely, that means that there is some physics that we can test in this regime. Uh, because whatever causes this high eccentricity, at least in field stars, is caused by the, by the supernova kick of the companion. Because the black holes that form, the primary mass black holes form so massive that they don't really kick anything. So it's the companion that kicks uh, the system, and with kick I mean there's an asymmetric uh, removal of material from the star that leads to a momentum being imparted on that star, leads to an increase in eccentricity, and that basically means that we can start using this area maybe as a way of testing what supernova kick models might work or not. Um, and then lastly, this panel here is the Rochlop overflow type, which I alluded to earlier, some such, some mass transfer is stable and some mass transfer is unstable. And this, um, this unstable mass transfer, there is some, some uncertainties in this because there's a lot of uncertainty in the, um, the requirement of this instability and the models that we've been using are probably a little bit out of date, especially for these very massive stars. And so, we thought, well, maybe if we just remove those systems that originate from the common envelope or unstable mass transfer, um, 
that leads to at least the peak being matched matched a little bit better. And now this isn't entirely fair by just removing these systems, right? But what it does show is that the physics that goes into this stability criteria and the stability calculations may well have a big impact on whether this part here fits. And so, whereas this high mass part can be used to constrain something about the eccentricity of the supernova kicks, this lower part may be used for the mass transfer properties of these systems. Th those are all extra uh, nice things that I found, but the main thing that I found is that whatever I put in here doesn't lead to a correct location for the peak. It's it's about 20 solar masses to the right uh, of what we need it to be, right? Now, is there something we can do about this? Is there some uncertainty that goes into these models that we can start to wiggle around with uh, maybe, maybe some physical assumptions that are quite uncertain uh, that we can invoke to say, well, let's introduce some extra changes in this and let's start putting things left or right. Well, yes. Um, but most of the things that go into this, at least in the study that Rob Farmer did, uh, seem to show that things were quite stable against these uncertainties. These uncertainties did not lead to a large range in a, a black hole mass. And so what we see here is some numerical assumptions, physical assumptions and environments that lead to uh, a range of black hole masses within that, that results from varying those, those parameters, basically. The only big one that leads to a very large shift in the, in the maximum black hole mass is the, the rates and the rates that means the, the, the nuclear reaction rates of the relevant uh, reactions. That's a carbon to oxygen uh, reaction rate. But um, I was hoping for a little bit more wiggle room. And uh, I started looking a little bit further and indeed the reaction rates are quite important. And especially if you if you use better resolution, then things start to shift a little bit even more, more so than we we found before. But also things like the rotation, additional cooling, and some uh, convection. And um, well, there's there's a bit more wiggle room than we than we may have thought before. And these these things that I'm listing here basically affect two different things. Either it affects the CO core masses that undergo these explosions. As I said earlier, from a certain range, things start to explode or not. So this first block will shift that to the left or the right. And this second block, it basically induces additional mass loss. So even uh, the, the range doesn't really change, but the explosion leads to more or less mass loss. And there's a couple here that I've uh, put an asterisk to. Uh, these asterisks indicate beyond standard model physics. Um, so it's it's speculative, but that might actually lead to a testable way of um, excluding this beyond standard model regime that they that they use. For example, the axion masses that they use for uh, for this axion parent stability, we could maybe use what we're finding here to exclude this or confirm what they're suggesting. Uh, that's a that's a big stretch though, but uh, so there's a couple of extra things that we can throw in the mix, and one of these is indeed the axial instability, which is a very similar stellar instability, but it's not caused by the formation of electron positron pairs, but it's now caused by the formation or the interaction with a certain axion, and this axion, depending on the mass of this axion, it will change when this instability occurs, and so. In these different different regions that you see here on the left plot, different colors indicate axions of different masses, and they will lead to instabilities for stars in different tracks, basically. And specifically, if you would look at the, the, the right plot, if the, the blue the blue lines are the standard model SM, um, if you would then introduce an axion with the same mass as the electron, if that would exist. And this 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 mass range has not, if I recall, been excluded entirely uh, by, by other observations. If you if that would exist, then that would lead to 
a shift in the in the core masses that actually explode all the way to the left with more or less the same number as that I need to to match this peak. And that's why I was like, okay, this is quite interesting. And it also might actually lead to something that works for me. Let's consider this a little bit more. Or in that in that case, let's use this as a potential motivation of shifting things a little bit further uh, out of the normal physics regime, right? Anyway, um, axions with higher masses don't lead to a large shift in the location because the instability would occur already due to electrons, right? But So only if it's like, electron mass or slightly lower will it actually change this this region of stars that uh, explode to a lower lower mass uh in a slightly less speculative fashion we can also just take a stellar model and do it in a more detailed way um there has been no improvement in this in in the reaction rates of this carbon to oxygen well improvements depending on who you ask it's a very debated uh reaction rate but if you put that into a, a detailed stellar evolution code like mesa and you properly deal with the numerics then that leads to a shift in the location of these black holes as well um in this case it goes instead of leftwards to to where i needed to go it goes upwards to the right uh, and so these updated models these better supposedly better uh better treated and and more up-to-date rates lead to a shift in the wrong direction for me. So that's, I wasn't entirely happy with that, but uh, it is what that is. So the farmer models were the ones that I was using before. And you see that they lead to a maximum mass of more or less 50 solar masses. But now with some updated rates and specifically updated uh, configuration for the for the numerics of, 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 these, of these models, you see that these these lines extend to a higher mass, higher maximum mass, uh, more or less 60 even. And in some of their um, more extreme versions that would go up to 80 or 90 even. So there's a lot of wiggle room. Um, but, but this motivated me or sort of uh, allows me to introduce some free parameters in my model that I could shift left or right quite a bit invoking okay either axial parent stability or or these other models to shift them around a little bit what i what i introduced here was extra parameters that basically uh lead to the same effect this curve shifting to the left or the right and and inversely then also shifting to lower maximum masses so you shift the orange lines to the left the maximum mass will also be at a lower location and for the blue line, if you shift it to the right, so a higher mass will start to become unstable. Then it also leads to a higher total, higher maximum black hole mass. So you can shift things left or right. The question now is, um, how much are we allowed slash uh, well motivated enough to shift? And can we find anything that fits? Um, and in that regard, yes, I can find things that fit um so anything that is so my orange is uh, is still the fiducial model which uh, which i showed earlier but now i can uh, introduce shifts to to the left of stars that are lower mass that start to become unstable or stars that are higher mass to start to become unstable and what i'm finding is that more or less 15 solar masses of reduction of the mass that undergoes this instability is necessary to match this peak, which is then this green line here. That's more or less the correct location, maybe 14, maybe 13. And this was explained by something like this axion parent stability shifting things significantly downward, right? Or rates being updated in the in the different location. But now with this um with this updated rates that I showed just now things would actually move upwards with more or less 10 solar masses. And so now I get these two peaks um, at minus 15 and uh, at plus 10 that I'm going to consider as the two extremes of my, of my next step because I now have a fit or something that fits the observations. 
barring some some other things, but that's not entirely fair, right? I'm introducing free parameters in my model and it just start shifting things and you know if at some point I can make a fit. So I do need some secondary observable to start to constrain things, right? When you say fit the model, you're not I mean you've got a tail there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you have Sorry. Yeah. And so this tail is indeed important. And so this tail, and that's the mm, this this set of uh where do you speak? lies basically sets a maximum limit that single stars can can attain right or binary stars in that matter but stars in a cluster can can merge continuously or hierarchically so once they have merged and they have a system with one mass here they can continue to merge to populate whatever is up here and so they uh, they have used the location of this peak to sort of constrain the contribution of globular cluster uh, originating black holes. There are other mechanisms to populate this, this region, but they're all either pro not of high enough rates or kind of obscure or debated that they actually populate this region. And the largest contender to actually populate this larger region here is cluster evolution or continuous merging within clusters. And so indeed, I cannot model this because I only treat stars as being from field binaries that are not in an environment where they can continuously merge up until higher masses. So yeah, I'm missing a tail, but maybe that's um, that's sort of like expected within my approach already. So now I do fit it and now but I, I do need some extra observable because otherwise it's not really fair, right? Um, and that's that's why I want to use transient rates because we're talking about supernovae. These things explode, and they are quite luminous, and that's something that we can observe. There is many uh, surveys that observe the rates of supernovae. Maybe we can use this to constrain something about uh, our our liberal uh, changes to the model, basically. So what I'm currently showing here is a buildup of, of different rates. Um, first of all, here's observations of binary black holes. And what I'm showing here is the event rate density of these of these events. So this is the rate of these events occurring per gigaparsec cubed. So within a certain volume of, of space. Um, and all of these detectors can sort of uh, calculate this sort of um, so they don't span the same as the volumes, of course, but they can calculate things in, in, in that volume. So binary black hole merger rate, which is the thing that I've been calculating now. And then we have the super luminous supernova rate, which will be a, a key part in this next, next part of the story, and the core collapse supernova rate. And what I'm going to add to this is my models, basically. Um, I'm showing this binary black hole merger rate which is these black dots, which almost matches with the observations, but we shouldn't forget that I removed this common envelope event. If I add those to them again, then do I actually match those? So uh, there's some information to be got in there. And then on the blue line, I show my core collapse supernova event rate, which is surprisingly well matching with the observed rate. And that was sort of an, a nice confirmation that um, at least my models and what is observed is not entirely too different from each other. They overlap within like in a factor of two, which is nice. And then I have the transient event rate of my two supernova that I care about, either this pulsation or parent stability supernova or the core collapse supernova. Uh, sorry, the parent stability supernova. So the one that pulsates and the one that just explodes in one go. And um, we can start comparing that to the observations, uh, but I also introduced these two variations, one to the left and one to the right, to start to match things. And if I introduce the one that actually matches the peak, you see that these rates for this two parastability supernovae go up by an order of magnitude. Luckily, the core collapse supernovae don't really change. That's expected. And if I then move 
uh, it to the right, which matches the up to date rates and uh, the the more improved models, then things move a couple of factors downward. And if we can zoom in a bit and we add some extra observations, we we may be able to now constrain this. Um, so again, at least this, the at redshift zero, the core collapse supernova rate matches quite well. But what about the pulsational parent stability supernova rate? <clears throat> so I added to this to this figure the superluminous supernova rate. I'm not sure how um, how familiar you all are with superluminous supernova, but first of all, it's not really clear what they are, except for that they are very luminous. Um, what we do know is that they 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 seem to have a, a different set of origins. Not all of them can be captured by the same type of supernova because they, they have clear different morphologies in their transient life curves. Some are very sharply peaked and fall off quite quickly and are very luminous. And some, but only a handful, are very broad and very long and are very luminous. And it basically means um, right, okay, so this point here, we see the superluminous supernova rays, especially with the parent, pulsational parent stability, but also with this normal parent stability, start to exceed the observed superluminous supernova rays. But we also know that maybe only 10% of these superluminous supernova could originate from this supernova type. And now, more or less 10%. Um, Someone else luckily calculated that for me because that's quite a difficult calculation. But what they basically, so Nicole had all calculated mm -hmm. that the rate of pulsate of parent stability supernova cannot exceed uh, more or less six to ten to the minus six times that of the core club supernova rate, but it's based on on this on this superluminous supernova rate. And that basically means that every movement I make up only creates more tension with the superluminous supernova rays. And so if I move, if I change this mechanism of parent stability to match this peak in the gravitational wave distribution, there is an increasing tension with the superluminous supernova rate that I'm creating. And basically, this cannot be the solution to, to this peak, which is even strengthened by the fact that if you go upwards, you make better match with the, the, the detailed models and it releases the tension. And so basically from this, I need to, I, I need to conclude that at least in my approach to calculating power parent stability supernova, it's excluded by the superluminous supernova rate. And I cannot use it to invoke uh, it as a solution to this peak. And now there are other proposed solutions to this peak. And, the, and the, uh, the implications that this peak is not from parastability is also quite, uh, well, that has to do with these clusters. If this peak lies somewhere else, then the contribution of clusters is quite different. Um, but there are other ways to find something like a peak. Uh, and, and Max, Max Biel showed that if there's a nice, a good combination between stable mass transfer, even those super Eddington uh, mass transfer, and chemically homogeneous stars, the combination of these three uh, and that together with winds leads to a peak in the location that actually is observed to have this peak. Um, and so only a very small part is uh, is contributed by this parent stability supernova because um, the models that he uses still has this range embedded in it. So there seems to be some other pathway to getting this peak. Um, there are other dynamical models that could lead to an overdensity within this region. Like, the only thing with this paper is like, they still have this parent stability, which leads to this 40 solar mass. Uh, even if you remove it, you still see this, you don't see this peak anymore. So parent stability is some part of this, of this story, but they do see somewhat of a peak without uh, so contributed by dynamical effects as well there. And, and then another paper which came out relatively recently in December 
um, which shows that there are some secondary effects of this parent stability supernova that have maybe been overlooked. So the model that I used was slightly a toy model. I, I took a fit and I introduced some sliding parameters in this. And the way that they have approached it in this way, they've they've basically made this sliding calculation within the detailed uh, code and they found that there might be some secondary effects in here. The only thing that I have with this paper is that what they find is that if you slide things to the left, so this is the, their fiducial model where you see the black hole mass and uh, the rate of these black holes merging. If you slide things to the left, that would still increase the tension that I'm finding with these supernova rates. So even if they find a secondary peak, which is slightly lower, which they say that, okay, that could match, that could be the match at 35 solar masses, they're basically moving leftwards will still make a higher tension with the superluminous supernova rate. Um, to a second, like a, a tertiary path that we could maybe use is to calculate the yields of these pulsational pair instability supernovae and put this into a galaxy evolution code. And this is something that I'm working on with, with, uh, with Rob here. Um, we do need, uh, some better yield sets for these supernovae. But we've been working on uh, an interfacing between his code, L galaxies, and our code called binary C, um, so that we can interface these, these yields of these supernova quite easily, and we can propagate that through his calculations. Um, we're not entirely there yet, because we need to now run some detailed models. But um, quite quickly, we could also use maybe the path of galactic chemical evolution to exclude this in a, in a, in a third way, basically. Because one of the things that, we, that I find in a very rough back of the envelope calculation is that um, at this point of shifting things to the left to match the peak, more than 1% more than, uh, of all the mod material that's being generated comes from these, super, these parent stability supernovae. And that might well be in tension with some of the yields that we uh, we observe, but it's it's still a little bit too early to say whether that's actually creating a tension or not. And we probably need a a better code than a back of the envelope calculation like I'm doing there to actually estimate this. Um, but yeah, there's different pathways on which we can exclude uh, the fact that pulsational parent stability is the cause of this. And just to wrap it up, I've implemented this new parent stability mechanism. Clearly, however, my fiducial fair version of this does not lead to a good match. I need to introduce some changes uh, and I can make a match, but that match is in tension with uh, observed transient rates. And um, yeah, that basically makes me conclude that this bomb is not caused by parent stability and that will have implications down the line on things like how the big the fraction of contributions of globular clusters to to all of the the merger rates, and that means something about the formation of globular clusters or these, yeah, right. Okay, that's what I wanted to uh, to show today. Thank you, David, for that very interesting talk. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. I um uh, myself sort of uh, thinking about this this remark about not matching the information. You kind of explored this, right? This kind of gray distribution that we have in the computer for the beacon. Um and um yeah, the gray the gray thing in the background there. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the, the origin of that that gray curve because it doesn't look like too many other observational distributions I've seen. Um, and that, I mean, in the sense that it's very smooth, and there's nothing oh. you're boxing or misbehaved or well, like, yeah, no, right, with it, like, like yeah, yeah. So effect. underlying in this is just a handful of observations, right? Yeah. Uh, so there is a reason. There's a reason why this is such a smooth curve. Yeah. That's basically because they they fitted a power law plus peak model to to this curve, uh, to this set of observations, and within the uncertainties. Of the observations, that leads to uh, the 
sort of like the, the, the region spanned by this, by this curve. There are other fits that people have made and even non-parametric fits, uh, but they all do find a feature in that same region. So this is not necessarily just a remnant of the fact that people impose a power law plus a Gaussian peak, because then you will find something like a Gaussian peak somewhere, right? But this is actually of all the, all, also all the other models, the simplest model that actually captures a feature that all of the models see. And otherwise it becomes an over an overfit model that you see the way it's really based. I'm also kind of thinking of, you know, I've heard, I've heard people who work on simulations in the past say things like, you know, you have to get the ratio the simulation spec or the ratio spec you want. And when you're talking about small numbers of statistics, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so between, I go all the way back to the first, like between the first data set that was uh, released, basically all two and all one, this curve, this location of this peak was also found, right? So now with the increase in number of, of, of well, the increase in numbers, uh, things will get constrained, but it, it remains a feature in this location. And even if there's a relatively simple fit made to it, even with more complicated fits or non-parametric fits, a feature is seen in that region, right? Thank you. And it's relatively easy to uh, to show that as the distribution with the side mark that this is actually behind there. Questions? Uh, can you also check the animal reproductions just to make sure yeah. we see it? There's... No questions, sir. So uh, I've got a question. In this uh, stellar evolution model where you have these big mass loss events, uh, you described it as several of them, but it seems that the specifics of this and it must be very deterministic uh, in order to give us a sharp cutoff on the mass. Is, right. is that the case? And to what extent in the models do you have to take into account the details of uh, these of this evolution in these events, or is it less sensitive to that? When so, um, right, in, in, the, in this figure we see, um, right, so we see a, a whole bunch of different curves and these curves originate from stars with different metallicities. Mm -hmm. And so there is some, some change in the in the opacity that basically is the result of these different metallicities that leads to a different structure and a different explosion mechanism or behavior. But otherwise, if you treat the star the same and it uh, the stellar evolution leads up to a core mass of that mass, then you should you should expect more or less the same um, same outcome. However, we are treating these things still in in one D stellar evolution codes and. In some supernova mechanisms, it's also quite clear that the initial turbulence or convection has quite a big effect on the outcome of, of these explosions, right? Um, so I think these results are fairly robust, but a good set of 3D, 3D models with the same global structures, but different microstructures might be interesting to, to lead to, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But I do think globally, this is quite a robust result. Um, I think so it's like inter intermediate mass black holes being formed in that region. Yeah, so have you found, I mean, do you know about any research that is found in, like in the um, I know of a couple of papers that, that seem to have a result in that direction, but I don't know entirely for sure. I couldn't look up the papers, but these are, if you get these very massive stars, then either you will get this effect, um, where 
this this explosive ignition is really not 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 enough to explode anything, and this star will just collapse onto itself, and that might actually well happen in these in these clusters. But I'm not sure if it's even necessary to have this super super massive stars within the center of a cluster, because this would happen for something like 400 500 solar mass stars. Um, and in your case, if you get very massive stars, you get something like a general relativistic instabilities that happen and just everything collapses onto a black hole as well. Problem is they're not in binaries. And so it might be a bit difficult to, to measure that, or they're probably not as often in binaries as, as we need them to be to detect them in this way. Um, interesting question. And I have some papers that I could lead you to if you want. Okay, hey, any more questions from uh, in the room? Just look like in online. There's some replying to it. Are there any surveys that you're looking for to um right, so the O four uh data really well the O four run is currently ongoing. Um so that they will definitely release a whole a whole bunch of extra material that we can start to use. And then this curve will really hopefully start to show some more features that we can use as anchor points, right? Because what I, I do predict that if in my better model, the one that's least in tension with the, with the uh, transients, there's a, 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 another peak here. So basically waiting on, on those results. And otherwise there's transient transient factories like the PTF and ZTF that we can use for this. Um, but I really think for me, the new uh, gravitational wave run is, is going to be uh, the, the one that can exclude or, or bring even more attention to, to, to the situation. Right. But, but currently the, this, this transient tension is already there and it won't relieve it. So what I'm predicting is that there's, another feature in this region here. And that would be basically a sort of confirmation to, to what I'm predicting here. 